Welcome to Close Up Radio, where our hosts, Doug Llewellyn and Jim Masters, engage today's top thinkers from around the world to bring you information, inspiration, and thought-provoking ideas you can put to use in your personal and professional life right now. Covering a broad range of topics, Close Up Radio digs deep to discover what makes today's top thinkers tick. Close Up Radio, where ideas matter. And now, here's today's host, Doug Llewellyn. Well, thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Nice to have you back with us here on Close Up Talk Radio. We're going to talk to somebody who's really fascinating today and uh, who's involved in a fascinating line of work. If you are a fan of uh, uh, mystery shows, detective shows, you know, police shows, like the FBI series on CBS, uh, <laughs> you're going to love this because we're going to be talking about forensic investigations of digital evidence. Uh, and as you know, on some of those shows, it is often the critical link that uh, helps the FBI or the law enforcement division, whichever it is, solve a crime. Um, and it's kind of amazing because when a case contains digital evidence, it requires testimony. That, and when I say case, I'm talking about a court case, uh, contains digital evidence. It requires testimony to clarify what kind of evidence was found and how it was found. You see that Bull, that's another show on TV that uses this kind of information a lot. Anyway, our guest is a digital forensic investigator. Uh, and they, that is investigators like him, collect and analyze digital evidence, including everything from text messages, pictures, email, and web history, to document metadata. Our guest is Patrick Seward, who is the founder of Pro Digital Forensic Consulting, headquartered in Richmond, Virginia. It's a one-stop shop for electronic evidence collection, analysis, and expert witness testimony in support of litigation and investigations at the governmental, corporate, and private levels. It's all in the pursuit of truth and justice, he says, that is, he being Patrick. Uh, he says, we find the truth for a living. It's really interesting. It's an amazing website. Uh, I'll give you the information on that if this is something you're interested in. Maybe you are in law enforcement and you need, need help cracking a case. This is the kind of person you could come to for help. And it's interesting, uh, Patrick's career began in law enforcement uh, back around the early, you know, 2000 at the patrol level in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, he later transitioned to serving as a school resource officer in both middle schools and high schools to kind of bridge the gap between law enforcement and the community. And it was in that role that he was introduced to the Southern Virginia Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force, where he learned how to conduct online undercover investigations. Uh, the, the, uh, the term for that, that group is called the ICAC, and they're responsible for tracking down online sexual predators of children and purveyors of child sexual abuse material on the Internet. Uh, he says it creates a protective layer between children on the Internet and predators who would seek to exploit them sexually. Well, he got so fascinated by what he was doing there uh, that he left law enforcement uh, in 2014 to launch his company, Pro Digital Forensic Consulting. Uh, and this company combines the best practices in forensic methodology with the most modern investigative techniques that are available today. Pro Digital Forensic Consulting offers what is described as a 360 degree litigation support approach with highly trained forensic examiners to conduct the analysis, report findings, and testify as expert witnesses as needed. That's a, that's a real capsule picture of what Patrick does and what his company does. And I find it fascinating that he's joining us today, so we're going to talk to him about all of this. Uh, and how important it is today to uh, to the help solving crimes, and not only that, but helping uh, convince uh, jurors that a case is actually correct and predators should be uh, convicted. So let's bring him on, Patrick Seward in Richmond, Virginia. Welcome, Patrick. Nice to have you with us today. How are you? Thanks, Doug. I appreciate you having me. Hey, listen, it's it's uh, a pleasure to have you here. Uh, I find your what you do sounds fascinating. Is it as fascinating as it sounds? <laughs> it Tell can me. be. Uh, it has it has an element of uh, of cool factor to it. Um, you know when we're when we're presented with 
a piece of digital evidence. There's some there's some cool parts to it, and there's some not so cool parts to it. Some kind of mundane parts to it, pretty much like any job. But uh, you know, the the aspect where we go in and extract data, and then analyze data, and then part- particularly when we report and and uh, testify about that data, is really where the rubber meets the road. So. You know, just like with everything, there's uh, there's some mundane things that go into it. But generally speaking, I would say it's a very uh, high tech, fast moving industry that uh, that I'm proud to be a part of. I assume you do this primarily for law enforcement, but are there other companies or fields where you know your your techniques and your your abilities are are warranted? How about that? I start. I started in law enforcement. Uh, the the number of law enforcement and governmental clients that I have right now are somewhat limited, just because there's a lot of people in law enforcement that uh, that do this, you know, primarily for them. Uh, mainly, right. what, what my clients are uh, involved in litigation or or investigations otherwise, whether it be a corporate investigation, like uh, some sort of corporate malfeasance, uh, employee misconduct, or something like that. I'll also get involved in a fair amount of divorce cases. Uh, where there's, uh, you know, either a, an accusation of infidelity or something like that. I tell everyone all the time that uh, affairs are conducted on mobile devices, so that's where the evidence is going to be. Uh, and then things like intellectual property theft or, uh, you know, other other types of uh, cases where there's going to be data involved. Now, what I tell all the attorneys that I work with and talk to on a daily basis is there's going to be data involved in any one of your cases uh, in, in 2022. There's, there's no doubt about it. Now, whether or not it's effective, you know, in, in the long run to, to hire an expert to, to go through that data and report to you back about it is, is another question, but there's data everywhere. So, uh, wherever, wherever that data is, uh, we're, we're here to assist with those litigation investigative cases. Which means you've got to be super sharp and, and, uh, aware of all the technical aspects of, Things like cell phones and laptops, computers, and that that kind of thing. How do you stay on top of that? Because you know these devices are constantly changing. Uh, how about that aspect of your work? Well, it's a challenge, uh, particularly when you're trying to work cases and uh, and put on training classes and things like that. But you know, it's really incumbent upon the individual examiner uh, in my role to to basically know what the different hardware that is that is coming out and the changes in the hardware and then the changes in the software. You know, mobile devices are the best example with regard to this because uh, I swear there's a there's a new iteration of the operating system on your phone uh, almost weekly, depending on what type of phone you use. Uh, so those things always are constantly being updated, so we have to update our knowledge uh, with regard to that. And that can be done in any number of different ways, whether it be white papers or research-driven uh, to webinars. You know, Fortunately, I, I really am just fed that information from people that are a lot smarter than me, uh, whom I trust. Uh, you know, Most of the time, I'm not the one going out and finding out those changes myself, uh, but but sometimes I am. So it all it just requires staying up with this. Um, you know, I, I I have this little anecdote that I, I left uh, this investigative field in law enforcement for about a year, and I came back to it uh, to launch my business, and I was amazed by how much that passed me by. So it was keeping up with the the technology, the changes, the different uh, iterations of whatever the case may be, whether it be a PC, Mac, mobile device, whatever the case is. Uh, keeping up with those changes is, is absolutely crucial. You know, it just occurred to me, uh, as we call it, there have been cases uh, in the past where uh, police have, have uh, recovered a cell phone um, and they've been unable to crack the password. And they've actually, I mean, it's been Apple, they've gone back to Apple to try and have Apple open the phone. And, and Apple, in most cases, has gone along and done it. Sometimes, you know, they're a little sticky about doing that. But uh, how about that aspect of something? When a when a phone comes to you, if if the password is, you know, you don't know the password, do you have the the, the secret knowledge of how to how to open that phone? I wish I did, <laughs> particularly with <laughs> iPhones. Okay. Uh, the, uh, right. the 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 kind of approach that we have to take nowadays. Now, it, it, I will say, several years ago, we used to be able to bypass a lot of passcodes and things like that, uh, but. Mm-hmm. As you can imagine, Apple and, and the manufacturers of Android devices have have really put a large emphasis on security and privacy. So anymore, our ability to bypass those things 
effectively uh, has to be outsourced. So I have several resources that I will reach out to. Now, law enforcement uh, has some tools that are specific to them to where they can do it, uh, but they th- those tools are on lockdown. They are specifically uh, marketed to and, and employed by law enforcement. Uh, so I don't, and as a private sector examiner, I don't necessarily have access to them. I may have access to the data they get from them through the uh, discovery process and you know going through litigation, but... Uh, I don't necessarily have access to to that part of it. Now I can again I can outsource that stuff to a third party uh, potentially to get that information. But on, you know, the there's a few factors that go into it, not the least of which is cost, and and those things can cost a lot of money. And so some clients just aren't aren't interested in paying that amount to get their data. Well, you know, it's interesting. You have affiliations with uh, you know like the Department of Homeland Security, the Secret Service. Uh, things. So you work for, uh, you know, uh, law enforcement, uh, you know, agencies quite frequently, don't you? Uh, I work a- along with them, uh, you know, again, trying to get to the to the heart of the matter. Uh, I'm also an adjunct instructor at one of our local police academies here in Virginia and have been for a long time. Uh, unfortunately, that doesn't, <laughs> because I don't carry a badge or a gun or and my paycheck right. doesn't come directly from them, it doesn't allow me access to that stuff. I wish it did, but... Uh, Maybe that'll change one day. Okay. Let's talk about an example of the kind of situations or cases you get involved with and that actually end up going to court. You've testified in court, right? Many, many times. Wrong. Many times. (laughs) (laughs) It's interesting. I talk to a lot of experts in different fields. You know, they may be doctors or whatever, but... Uh, going into court and testifying, be you know, before an attorney who's trying to grill them and uh, throw them off, uh, is a whole different ball game. Uh, were you prepared for that the first couple of times when you went into court to testify? You know, I had I was fortunate in that working my way up from a patrol level police officer all the way through an investigator and then into the private sector as an expert, as a retained expert. Uh, my my my. Uh, uh, feet into the frying pan, uh, you know, so to speak, was, was somewhat mitigated. Like, I, I would, I would, my initial testimony experience dealt with traffic tickets and things like that, and that's very low level. Uh, but when you get into very highly technical things and testify as an expert, of course, it's kind of a different ball game. Um, was I prepared for it? I, I would say yes, in, in a manner of speaking. I had a, when I was a, a, an investigator on the ICAC task force, I had a couple of prosecutors who were very, very good, not only with the technical side of what we did, but in uh, helping me to become a better expert um, and a better, a better witness. Uh, and, and really what, what I do in, in almost every given case that I testify in is I go into it knowing the facts of the case uh, as best I can. I go into it, obviously, with the approach of telling the truth, because <laughs> if you don't tell the truth, that's not going to be good for anybody, including me. Um, and then, and then, you know, just uh, as a conver- at a conversational level with with whomever is questioning me, it's a little bit easier under direct examination than it is under cross examination. But I really just try to have a conversation on the stand in front of the judge or jury. And if you really approach it that way, it can kind of reduce the stress and the and the even the formality of a little bit. Interesting. You know, you mentioned uh, you referred to it. Let me ask you about your experience with the Southern Virginia Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. What was that about, and what did you do? I initially started off kind of working case. I was a resource officer, a school resource officer at the time, uh, and when when we signed on as a member of the of the uh, task force, and I initially started off working cases part time, you know, after school, you know, uh, mm. just for a little bit of extra uh, extra income and to see what would happen. And uh, so they, of course, they trained me up in the proper way to do it, but. Um, I ended up making one case initially, and then the second case I ever made was extremely high profile. We uh, we arrested the uh, head soccer coach at Howard University in a case that began and ended in one night. Uh, and so from there, it was really kind of warp speed ahead as far as doing the undercover stuff online. And, and really, what I would do is set up profiles to act as a as a 13 year old girl, and uh, and people would approach me and say all sorts of horrible, nasty, sexually explicit things and propose to do those things to, to me thinking that I was a 13-year-old girl and the way that the law is written, uh, that is a serious offense, uh, particularly in Virginia. It bears a, a minimum mandatory five-year uh, sentence upon conviction. That's per count. 
So uh, yeah. it, it, it obviously was a very big deal, and so we made many, many cases together, um, me and the prosecutors and the, and the rest of the task force, uh, to where you know there was some case precedent that was sent uh, as far as far as um, sentences that juries gave. It seemed like we had a lot of cases that went to a jury trial, which is odd in those in those types of instances. A lot of people just don't want to don't want to approach that stuff with a jury. But and for whatever reason, in my jurisdiction, they did. And uh, and so we uh, we ended up taking a lot of cases to trial, and the jury ended up throwing the book at most of them, if not all of them. So uh, it well, was uh, it, it was it was a very a very eye opening experience, and of course a very a kind of a career making experience. You make you make it sound like this goes on quite a bit. Uh, you know, those of us who are not in law enforcement uh, aren't really aware about it, don't hear about it, but it is uh, goes on a lot. It does. Uh, you know, back when I was doing it, uh, we were mostly on a desktop computer. Now, these days, right. the, the old saying was, with my prosecutors, was, you know, the, the, the investigators, being me, would fish where the fish are. Well, now the fish are on a mobile device. Uh, so, it, you know, the, the paradigm has changed a little bit with regard to that, but it certainly still goes on uh, much more than people think or realize. Uh, um, the Internet is is a doorway into your home and it, most people would not leave the door to their home unlocked so without without putting a lock or some sort of security measure in place with regard to that you're leaving your your children wide open so we you know the the job of the task force was to try to put a put a a a, a police a law enforcement presence in between the predators online and the kids that were online by the way, what what how did you find your experience as a school resource officer? I mean, you were a patrolman before uh, but, but how about working in the schools? Did you was that enjoyable? Was that challenging? It was challenging in that it was uh, a different. It was it was kind of it was a different speed. First of all, certainly right. uh, different than than working patrol work. I was kind of a hard charger on patrol. I won the DUI uh, award several times, and uh, you know I, I I wrote a lot of tickets and made a lot, a lot of arrests and warrant service and things like that. And so you go from that to being uh, essentially uh, uh, a, a liaison inside the schools to, to interact with children, you know, it gets, gets you a little bit out of your comfort zone. But I tell you, it was a very good experience in uh, how the how things function outside of regular pat- patrol police work, uh, but still working as a law enforcement officer. Um, taught me a lot about communication skills. Taught me a lot about how to deal with people, uh, both inside the school system, their you know the parents of the children, the children themselves. Uh, so it, you know it was a very eye-opening and very educational experience, and, and one of those things that I'm happy I did. Good for you. Good for you. But prior to that, were, were you with a uh, the Virginia State Police or, or no? A local? I started off with the uh, Virginia Commonwealth University Police Department in uh, in oh. Richmond, Virginia. And most university police departments are pretty small and and not really that active. This is not that. It was it was the opposite of that because it, it's in the middle of VCU's in the middle of downtown Richmond. So uh, there's a lot of the same problems you would have in the inner city. You would you would have at that university police department. So there was a little bit of a crash course there as well. Well, good for you. What you know? Look back on it. What made you decide you wanted to go into law enforcement? Do you remember in the very beginning? I remember being asked by uh, by some some departments that I interviewed that same question, and and you know, twenty twenty one year old Patrick would say, "Well, it was to uphold the Constitution," which is kind of a a silly answer now. Forty five year old Patrick looking back on it, but uh, ultimately it was to to try to uh, help people as best I could to try to make some sort of positive impact on people's lives. Uh, it wasn't until many years into the career that I was actually able to do that. I mean, you know, I, there were some cases in, the, in working the task force where we actually were able to lock up some guys that were doing some really horrible real things to real children. And uh, and so, you know, that impact, uh, just because I was working patrol and writing tickets in the initial years of that, of that part of my career, uh, that impact, you know, came about uh, through the evolution of it. So it was it was very nice to to see that kind of through to fruition that kind of career goal. Now, well, good 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 for you. Good for you. It's a you know, a great profession to be in. Well, let's get back to what you're doing right now uh with your company and uh tell me what does it mean when you say you take a 360 degree litigation support approach? D- define that. What does that mean? 
Yeah, there's there's other uh, digital forensic service providers that will offer to get your data and report your data, and that's really all you get from them. There's not a lot of consultation that goes on. There's not, you know, there's there's a there's a little bit of work that happens, and then there's a, a big bill that you get at the end of it. And sometimes they'll come testify. What I do, and what I try to do with every case that that we get is. Uh, take it in, uh, get all of the available information being, uh, let's say I'm working on a criminal case, whether it be for the prosecution or the, or the defense. Uh, I, I want to see all the police reports, all the search warrant affidavits, all, the, all that relevant information that goes into the data, that, that, is, that is the basis for getting the data. Uh, and then, of course, we do our data analysis, and then, and then I always approach things from a very realistic perspective. Uh, I had a client uh, call me earlier today. And she was asking about doing a, a, an analysis on a computer, and I said, well, you know, there's 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 a there's not a uh, there's not a lot that I can promise you that we're going to find based upon what you're telling me, you know. So I, I'm very pragmatic in my approach uh, that we take to, to working the cases. Uh, I want to be very realistic. I don't want to set up people for any kind of disappointment or, uh, or false expectations. Uh, so. That, along with the consultation piece, I like to work with the attorneys with whom I work in a partnership um, as a teamwork environment where we're working together to try to find the, the truth and then uh, present that in, in the light most favorable to who, whomever we're working for. Uh, so that's what I mean by a 360-degree approach. It's not just get the data, report the data, you know, move on. It's, a, it's more of a... a, a a partnership I have in, in, in every case that we work with, with whomever we're working with. That really does sound amazing. We're talking with Patrick Seward. He's the, uh, the founder and the head of Pro Digital Forensic Consulting, headquartered in Richmond, Virginia. It's a great website, by the way. Um, it's interesting. I mentioned this to Patrick before we started. It's ProDigital4N6.com. Uh, again, Pro Digital. And then the figure four, the letter N, and then the figure six dot com. And I said, Patrick, I don't understand that. What's the four N six? And he said, Read it fast. Forensic. That's <laughs> it. For digital, pro digital forensic dot com. It's a very good, very creative website, uh, and very informative indeed. Talk to me a little bit about the various kinds of devices that are brought into you. Uh, for you to try and you know dig what you can uh, information wise out of those 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 uh, devices i mean i obviously it's cell phones it's what laptops you do mobile device uh, mobile device forensics computer forensics uh, cellular rec record analysis there's a lot that you do talk a little oh, yeah. bit about yeah, so I would say probably at this point 75% of the cases that we work are mobile devices, and meaning mobile devices meaning cell phones, tablets, uh, sometimes some standalone GPS devices, and they run the gamut everywhere from your Apple or Android devices to uh, I had a case in the last uh, eight months where it was two what we call clamshell or or feature phones, you know your your ones that you buy uh, you know at the gas station for 19.99 and you buy the, the you know the minutes to put it on. I've had I've had those in the office uh, in in the not too de distant past. So uh, that's probably about 75 percent of the of the cases that we work. And then uh, the other the other percentages would be uh, computers, of course, both uh, PCs and Macs. Uh, you know, a lot of people think a computer is a computer, but Macs do require some additional expertise and knowledge and and even tools to be able to uh, analyze and report about uh, effectively. So I uh, kind of specialize in, in the Mac thing. I'm a, I'm a big Mac fan, even though uh, all my forensic tools, for the most part, work on Windows. Um, and then uh, the cellular records analysis is a, is a huge burgeoning part of, of what we do. Uh, essentially, to boil it all down, your cellular provider keeps records of your activity, including location activity, uh, as well as all the other activity that goes on with your cellular device, and so explain in litigation, what you mean by explain what you mean by location activity. Did they keep records of where your cell phone has been as you've gone around? Is that right? In a round, yes, in a roundabout sort of way. So there's a couple of different types of data. Uh, the first is what we call just regular cellular call detail location records, uh, which is a generalized location of where your phone is during the time of a call or text or data transmission. 
Um, and so that is related to a, a GPS coordinates where a cell site or a cell tower is and then a direction off of that cell tower. So we can estimate a location of a device based upon those records, and we can map those out and even testify about, about their, uh, their veracity, if you will, or, or uh, testify about what the records are showing us and then how we, how we go about mapping it and illustrating it. Um, there are also more specific location records that are not available for as long a period of time from the carrier, but they intend to estimate the actual GPS latitude and longitude of the device itself. Now, that's an estimation, uh, and it's based upon proprietary methods that the, that the cellular carrier uses. But, again, it can be very, very useful. If you think about it, particularly in the criminal context, but also in civil, in civil cases, uh, it's, a, it's, it's growing in popularity where putting someone at a location or a near a location at a, at a particular time or series of time events uh, can be super useful evidence. Uh, and so it can help to confirm or refute claims in any number of, of cases. And, and so it's, it's great evidence. It's evidence that most people don't have access to themselves. So it's, uh, it's kind of what I call pure evidence. Um, they, in other words, you can't call up your carrier and say, I want to get my cellular location records. They, just, they simply won't give it to you without a court order or a search warrant or something like that. Uh, there are right. some, some small exceptions to that. But uh, so, yeah, we, th- we, we are able to take those records and then uh, map them out and, and construct demonstratives and testify about, their, uh, about what they show us and, and uh, hopefully uh, either, either put bad guys away or keep bad guys out of j- or keep good guys out of jail or, or prove that someone was or was not where they were claimed to have been. So it's, it's great evidence. That's pretty fascinating. Most people have no idea all the kind of information that can be uh, dug out of a out of a cell phone and cell phone records, do they? They just uh, they think you, you can erase something with your phone, but uh, you can't in many instances, right? But it goes <laughs> well, yeah. there. And there's a lot that's going on in the phone that people have no access to, have no you know knowledge about what's going on on the phone. That's only available through a forensic data extraction. So. Um, there's a lot that's going on. If you think about that, device is always on, <laughs> even with the newer iterations yeah. of the iPhone. Even if you try to turn it off, it's not off. <laughs> so it's right. always on. Um, I hate to use the word tracking, but it does always have some sort of location uh, data associated with it. It's not necessarily tracking you, but uh, some of that data can be uh, extracted and analyzed and used uh, as evidence in our cases. So. Uh, and, and, of course, their capacity is, is growing exponentially with every iteration of the new devices that come out. Uh, you know, now you can buy an iPhone that's uh, one terabyte. You know, that's, that's a heck of a lot of data. Most people can't that's fathom That's a lot of data. data. That's right. It is, it is a ton <laughs> of data. Uh, so, and of course, it takes a long time to go through it, too. Oh, my gosh. Well, I must tell you, it really sounds very, very interesting in what you're doing. Uh, and, and, and not only that, you, as we pointed out, you work for law enforcement agencies, you work for private investigators. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite a wide array of, uh, you know, customers that you have uh, utilizing your services. So uh, congratulations. You've got a rare company there. Good for you. How big is your team, by the way? Uh, we've got a team of. Uh, I'm I'm the primary. I'm the founder and principal yep. consultant. We've got a team of several right. analysts uh, right now, three or four on on staff that are that are helping us out. You know, one of my goals has been to try to build a staff that is experienced in in investigation, not just digital forensics, but in investigation. Because you have to be kind of a, an investigator uh, aside from the digital component of it to be effective. So. Uh, people with law enforcement backgrounds, people with expert witness designations, all that, uh, you know, any, any, anybody who's, who's got those bona fides behind them, you know, I'll have a conversation with them and, and, uh, and, and vet them and see if we can sign them up to be part of our team. Well, good for you. Well, listen, this has been amazing. Our guest has been Patrick Seward. Again, he's the founder and the head of Pro Digital Forensic Consulting there in Richmond, Virginia. And again, that website is cool website it's pro digital 4 n 6.com 4 n 6 that means forensic <laughs> patrick <laughs> very creative good for you thanks for taking the time to tell us what you do it's amazing congratulations thank you Doug. I appreciate good luck it. okay you are welcome all right everybody hope you enjoyed that it's amazing what they do uh absolutely amazing 
Thanks for being with us. We'll see you next time. Okay? Have a great day, everybody. Bye for now.